If you're wealthy, you have control over your choices. You can make the choices you want in life, whether you're a school teacher or a billionaire. If you're rich, life is going to control you at some point. The people who are most successful believe that they are able to control their destiny and drive forward. If something goes wrong, they assess and say, huh, what did I do wrong? Could I have done something better? They don't say, well, and a locus of control that is sort of outer directed and not inner directed is the locus of control that says, things are happening to me. I don't have control over this. There is across the board, no successful person. And I don't define this by wealth. You could be the, the greatest high school English teacher. That person, you know, that man or woman has focused on becoming the greatest high school English teacher in New Jersey and takes, you know, his or her job super seriously. That's the locus of control. They're going at that person and that classroom and that job to try to be the best they can. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you like and comment below. And to find future episodes in your feed and push notifications, make sure you subscribe. And if you click the little bell, you'll get every new episode as it's released. Thanks again for watching. Today I'm sitting down with Paul Sullivan. Paul is the founder of The Company of Dads, and he was a New York Times columnist for 13 years where he wrote the column Wealth Matters, which covered the subject of Americans' relationship with wealth and wealthy people and the differences between being wealthy and rich. In 13 years, Paul wrote over 600 articles for his Wealth Matters column with his goal to use the lessons from the very wealthy to help people of more modest means. But what he found over that time was how differently the wealthy lived versus everybody else. In today's episode, we will discuss some of the most interesting findings that Paul discovered in his 13 years interviewing some of the wealthiest and the most interesting people in America. In those 13 years, Paul spoke to over 6,000 people while conducting his research for Wealth Matters. And Paul found the most fun and interesting stories were those about how the wealthy spent their millions and billions. He wrote about thoroughbred horses, wine collecting, race car clubs, yachting, personal perfume making, and four-star dog hotels, just to name a few. While Paul's column was interesting for both the readers and himself, it allowed him to remain in his other secret full-time job, which was lead parent of his three daughters, three cats, three dogs, and three fish. This has led Paul to his new passion and his business, The Company of Dads, which is a platform that will help bring together lead dads who are the lead parents in their household, whether they are full-time, stay-at-home parents, or the ones who maneuver their work around the needs of their children, their spouse, and everything else in their house. So with that said, let's dive in with Paul Sullivan. Hey guys, I'm gonna take a quick pause to introduce the first sponsor on The Jay Gould Show. I am happy and proud to say that this show is now sponsored by Witham Smith & Brown, which is a forward-thinking, technology-driven advisory and accounting firm that is committed to helping big and small companies be more profitable, efficient, and productive in today's complex business environment. Witham now also has a dedicated crypto and blockchain technology team to help early-stage businesses properly navigate all the crypto tax-related matters. I've been using Witham both personally and professionally for nearly a decade for all of my business's personal needs as well. I'm very happy with them and I highly recommend Witham. You can contact Witham by visiting their website at witham.com. Now back to the show. Paul, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for coming on. Uh, the first question I ask everybody who comes on the show is tell me who your top five are. These are the five people that you're surrounding yourself with the most these days outside of your immediate family, professionally. Um, so who's who's shaping Paul's thinking these days? This is really confusing to me. I mean, you, you started off the introduction and you said, you know, I've got three daughters, three dogs, three cats. <laughs> three fish. Uh, I, I'm really kind of a top three guy. Uh, you know, do, do I get to deviate or does that mess? Sure. Go ahead. Theory? Knock yourself out. <laughs> you know, uh, look, when it comes to thinking about money, uh, of, you know, Brad Klontz is a guy that I have, uh, long been in touch. He's a financial psychologist. We met, uh, when I interviewed him during the financial downturn, we did some research together for, uh, my second book and, and now he's become uh, a sort of real, you know, sounding board. Uh, another guy is uh, Eric Anders Lang uh, from the golf world. Um, he and I, you know, met in the most amazing place in the world, uh, Pebble Beach, um, <laughs> when he was just starting out uh, a business, not having nothing at all like the company of dads, but a similar structure of, 
you know, content, community commerce. And he's been incredibly generous uh, explaining to me um, how he's gone about this. Um, I'd say, you know, I've got three great friends from childhood and uh, I don't want to pick favorites, uh, but I will, uh, at least uh, for the purpose of this. My friend Mike Danucci, um, he manages about a billion dollars at, at Merrill Lynch, a little over a billion dollars at Merrill um, out of their West Hartford office. And he, you know, he's further along in this this movie of, of child rearing than I am. He's got a kid going, son going off to college, a daughter who may go to uh, in a sort of elite music academy next year. But he and I probably talk two or three times a week. And honestly, he's one of those people that I feel I can uh, tell sort of all my you know personal problems to. That he he actually gets you know what's happening. Um, I know you said we weren't supposed to talk about our family, but. You know, and this isn't, I don't want this to be sappy. I don't want this to be, you know, too much. But really, my wife, you know, my wife has run her own business since 2013. And I, I mean, part of the reason I started the company of dads is because we have such a strange, you know, relationship and strange, which is good for us, but it's totally inverted, where she's always <laughs> earned way more money uh, than I have. Um, I've always been happy to be the lead dad while being, you know, a columnist for the New York Times, while writing two books, while, you know, giving you know, you know, talks, but we live in a town uh, in Connecticut where, you know, most of the men are what I call go to work dads and, and most yep. of the women are, are stay at home moms. So it's a it's a, a different different dynamic. Uh, and then the fifth would be, you know, uh, Tina Ritchie. Tina Ritchie lives in uh, outside of Fort Worth, Texas, and he and I were baptized together, which means we've known each other uh, 48 years. And I would say that, you know, we've done different things in our lives, you know, different types of careers, our lives have gone in different ways, but uh, he's the lead dad himself, uh, which if you knew him when we were kids, you'd never imagine him being the dad at, at all. Um, so, I mean, it's really those those five that, you know, they bring it home, they give me advice for sure. I think, you know, at the top, we're more people who give me advice, who is sort of, you know, Mike Danucci in the middle as a fulcrum, but at the bottom, um, I guess, or I guess the other end of the, better than say bottom, the other end of the seesaw are people who kind of keep me grounded and, and allow me to sort of, you know, see the world, not from the perch of, you know, Fairfield County, Connecticut, see the world as it, as it is for the majority of America. Yeah. I like this. I like this question because, um, uh, you are kind of the average of the people you surround yourself with. And, um, you know, so if you're, if you're surrounding yourself with like high achievers, you're more likely to maybe become a high achiever or try to strive for things. And if you're not, you might not be, but it's not always the case either. So I had an author on Jeff Booth who wrote The Price of Tomorrow. And when I asked him the question, it was just like, just people in town. He just, this was, I was like, what about like all these interesting people that I see you do podcasts with? He goes, nah, I don't really talk to those guys all the time. <laughs> it's like, okay. So his like shape, the way he thinks is a lot, mostly from reading. So he reads a lot. And then, so that's kind of made him, uh, think about the world differently versus being around those people all the time. And, um, but he also built a really cool, interesting business too. Uh, he was a tech founder for BuildDirect.com. Um, so I'm sure he like had influences from VCs and stuff over the years. But uh, these days, you know, for the last so many years, he's like, uh, I'm just me and my wife and kids and just, I read a lot. <laughs> I'm just amazed that that question doesn't offend people because I mean, we're Americans. There's nothing average about us. Like we should be the <laughs> o above average of the five people, you know, we, we talked to. <laughs> Globally, that's that's 100% right. But in America, people don't realize, <laughs> they don't they don't see it that way. And you know this because we'll talk about this now. 80% of us, 80% of us are above average drivers. It just doesn't make people that don't understand <laughs> numbers and math. So I want to ask you what inspired you to create and develop and write that column, Wealth Matters. What, what was the impetus? What, 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 where did that come from? It actually goes back further than the New York Times. I, I was at the Financial Times from uh, 2000 to 2006. And, you know, people always ask me, you know, was the New York Times the best job you ever had? And I said, no, I mean, the New York Times is a super interesting job. But yep. the best job I ever had was working in the pro shop at the Country Club of Wolverham when I was 15 years old. The second best job I ever had was working at the FT. Um, because back then at the FT, um, I was hired by a guy named Robert Thompson, who's a hell of a lot better well-known today than he was back then because he's Rupert Murdoch's number two. And Robert encouraged all of us to just sort of cause a little mischief to sort of explore different areas that we wanted to write about. And, and Robert, you know, left the FT to go to Times London, do a whole bunch of different things. Um, but in 2005, 2006, um, there was an interest from the then editor, Lionel Barber of the FT, to start covering wealth. Um, and at the time, Robert Frank was doing it for the Wall Street Journal. Robert Frank, who wrote Richestan, um, really great guy. And I started it for the FT. And I always kind of set it up and say, you know, Robert had his, his thing and I had my thing. We were very different, even though we were writing about wealth. 
And the easiest example is, you know, Robert would always find out who had bought the newest, you know, 300 foot yacht, 350 foot yacht, mm-hmm. and talk about the yacht itself, how much it costs, et cetera, who owns it, who, you know, who had, you know, the 345 foot yacht and is now jealous that there's a yacht that's five feet longer than his. <laughs> what interested me always was, okay, so you have that yacht. How does it work? You know, how much does it cost to put gas in it? Do you, how, how do you get insurance for it? Do you charter it out? Like how many crew are on that yacht? And so I was always, if, if, if Robert was kind of looking at, at the bigger picture, I was always looking at the nuts and bolts. And yeah. that's the column I really created for the FT. And it kind of continued on. There was a brief between the FT and the New York Times. There's a magazine called Condé Nast Portfolio, which mm-hmm. couldn't have been launched at a worse time uh, in America. It was launched in 2007, and it blew through $100 million by 2009. So I was happy to have been part of that you know, dissolution of, of wealth uh, on the part of the Condé Nast people. Um, but at the... At, at the times, they, they knew the column from the FT, and it, it took a similar, I took a similar approach to it. I just wanted to figure stuff out because it's too easy, and we see this on social media all the time. It's too easy to get blinded by the new bright shiny thing. I, I wanted to always go under the hood, and so that was, you know, something I applied. Whether I was writing about something as sort of you know mundane and potentially boring as tax changes. Um, or whether I was writing about something as, you know, depending on your point of view, you know, sexy or ridiculous as creating your own perfume, uh, I wanted to figure out how it worked. And so in that perfume column, which you know, <laughs> had a lot of interesting comments to it, uh, it was like, first, the obvious question, why the hell would you do this? And second, it was like, how do you even do this? Like, how do you even, I don't, I couldn't even imagine, like, if I wanted to create my own aftershave what i would do and so that was really the <laughs> driving start? force behind all these comments. yeah yeah just figure it out how does it work and that's always been my my approach i like i said i i, I interviewed this guy who wrote this book uh rich habits and he said uh, th- th- the whole purpose of his book was essentially like a path on how to get wealthy in america right and he said there's like four paths um there's the savers path which anybody can basically do if you have a middle if you're if you're uh kind of a middle middle income earner so to speak middle class um you could just save, right? And just be very frugal. And it takes you like 50 years to, to get to the millionaire status, right? There's the virtuoso path he calls, which is uh, the folks that are like the professionals. These are your doctors, your lawyers, accountants, et cetera, um, architects, et cetera. Um, and then, um, there's, uh, then there's the dreamer path. That's kind of the path that I took, which is uh, entrepreneurs, entertainers, actors, et cetera. Um, but whatever. So, so basically, there's multiple different paths is what he's saying. When you were what, doing was, your, what was the fourth one? Do you remember the fourth um, one? Oh, I'd missed the fourth one. Um, Corporate climbers, right? So these are the people that go to like executive, they work their way up the corporate ladder at like uh, Starbucks or something like that or at, at Facebook and uh, and they make their millions of dollars in stock options, right? Um, and, you know, the, the the slowest path, he said, was the saver's path. Um, the fastest path and the most wealth is the dreamer path, but it's the most kind of volatile path, right? Um, there's bankruptcies, there's divorces, there's all kinds of things because your wife might be like, what the hell, give up on this crap after three bankruptcies, right? Um, and, and the dreamer's just never gonna give up, right? Um, um, and some of them never make it, right? Um, but many do. Uh, and uh, but the corporate climber path is more of a predictable path. Uh, the virtuoso path is more of a much more predictable path, right? Um, and it also requires a little bit of high intellect and stuff too at an early age and certain paths at an early age, right? But I was just curious. Like his findings were interesting because he he interviewed like a couple hundred people. You interviewed a lot of people too. Did you find something similar with the people? Did you did you recognize that at all? Like the paths of people getting wealthy, like or yeah, I'd like to hear from your opinion on this. Yeah, I'll answer it in two ways. One, you know, in my second book, The Thin Green Line, I sort of broke it down into sort of three categories. You know, back to the three daughters, three dogs, three cats thing. You know, everything is threes, <laughs> uh, and that was you know I call it sort of people who similar to the savers, the idea that you just this is kind of what my grandfather did when he worked in the post office. You just put your head down. And you live very modestly. And I don't think my grandfather ever made more than, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year. I mean, he died in two thousand, so you gotta go back in time. But but at one point he had saved something like four or five hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars, which would blew my mind how somebody with such a you know, just in relation to what he had earned annually and what he yep. had saved. And and that's a person who at the end they, you know, they've saved all this money and then they have all but they have a lot of, you know, reservations and some might say psychological hang ups over what do you do with it now? Can you actually spend it? And so that's but that that person is very rare. The other person in yep. this triumvirate that I had who's very rare, uh, is, is you know, I call it it's sort of I don't want to say like dissolution because that's a really negative term, but think of somebody who in, either inherits 
uh, a ton of money, and that's going to be the apotheosis of their earnings. Or um, somebody like you know a professional athlete, and you know I don't want I, I don't know all the different people on the but you know like a, a founder too. Like the chances of a professional athlete ever earning more than his you know football contract for the Giants or the Jets after he leaves the NFL is really slim. And so they have to protect that money. Same as founder of a tech company, you sell that company for, you know, fill in the blanks, you know, $30 million, $70 million, $110 million. The chances of you doing that a second time are slim. You can invest in other stuff. People get lucky, obviously, but most people, so you have to guard it in a separate, in a different way. But those are the, the, the barbell approach. Those are the yeah. extremes. In between is just what I call the make and spenders. And these make and spenders could be at any income level. They could be, you know, my, my aunt who was a, a high school special ed teacher, you know, they could be somebody, you know, I remember interviewing Stuart Sternberg, uh, who owns the, um, the Tampa Bay Rays. I mean, it, he's one of like 32 major league baseball owners. Everything he's doing now is making and spending because he's he, he's got an asset that's worth a ton, but he's got to earn the money to keep the stadium going, to to keep the players on the play. That's most people. Um, but when you think about breaking people up, I always said that you know the people I enjoyed talking to the most uh, were billionaires, and over 13 years I got to know a lot of billionaires because billionaires, unless they're completely delusional, understand that there's some degree of luck to what yep. they've done. Absolutely. You can't set out and say, you know what, I'm going to sell this company one day for two and a half billion dollars. It just doesn't you know, work that way. Whereas people can set out and say, you know what, I'm going to be uh, a corporate attorney. Yep. And at the end of my life, I'm going to have between 25 and 50 million dollars in the bank. But as you said, that's a high intellect to start. You're doing that going to the best schools in the world. Uh, and it's not, it's not easy. But I always found like, people who were worth in the tens of millions um, were a little edgier than people worth <laughs> billions. But it also came to like how they made it. You know, I, I remember once there was this, this rival to the uh, Forbes list and what was it called? It was called Wealth X. And Wealth X um, was able to track everybody's net worth. And, you know, I, you know, for me, I always thought the worst thing in the world would be to be worth like anything over a billion. Like the best thing would be to worth $990 million <laughs> because you're on nobody's billionaire list and you can right. do all the things that a billionaire can do. But WealthX ruined that because they went and they could tell you, you know, you're worth, you know, $37 million. Your next door neighbor is worth $21 million. The guy down the street is worth $45 million. Uh, you know, I see all these websites do this crap. It's like, how do they really know what someone's net worth is? It's like, I see stuff on me and I'm like, they're way off on me. <laughs> the WealthX is all the guys who had, who had been at, at Forbes and had built it. Um, and they use it essentially to go to private banks and sell their information. But one, one of the founders told me, he said, the first thing everybody asks me when I sit down and they're sitting with fill in the blank, you know, senior managing director at UBS, yeah. they say, like, do you have me on your list? And they're like, I do. Like, well, how much am I worth? And they'll say, you know, I'm worth, you know, you're worth twenty three million dollars. Twenty three million dollars is a ton of money for everybody in the world except the tip top. And then he said, <laughs> inevitably, that guy who said, I'm worth twenty three million dollars, he say. Hey, can you tell me? Uh, can you tell me what uh, you know, John Smith over there? What, what's John Smith? What's he worth? Like, sir, we can't do that. We can't just be like, come on. Is he worth more than me? Or is he worth more than or less than me? And that's that's where we get. I mean, that's where money becomes psychology because that's what. Yeah. You're sort of well, there's a number where you get to, and uh, I have a lot of friends in my space in, in the uh, tech world that you don't really need any more money, right? It's really about your kids now, and it's about maybe your heirs, your, your grandkids and stuff like that. You're working for legacy at that point if you keep going for more money. How much more do you need? I mean, how much can you spend, you know? I mean, I guess you, you've, you've, you've interviewed a lot of these people that can spend a lot of money, but it's completely meaningless. Like, you don't really need it. It doesn't make you any happier, that's for damn sure. But that's not what, that's not what drives the people to be, um, you know, sort of insecure. It's that basic competition. So if you were coming up at the same time with somebody who had an idea, and you know, you sell your company for thirty million dollars, and you think this guy's a complete moron uh, who doesn't do anything right, and he sells his company for seventy million dollars. You're gonna say, "WTF? How is that? You know, maybe you won't, but like that's human, luck. Hu that's human nature, though." But that's talk. I say luck because it's timing, right? So I had the first video sharing site before YouTube was around. Sold it for equity. We got sued by Universal Music. They navigated those waters better than we did. Had a better UI. They sell for one point six billion dollars. 
it's just like I was too early in the curve. Uh, Chad Chad Hurley, his I don't know if you know this, but his father in law is is Jim Clark, which is one of the co founders from Netscape. The guy's a billionaire, right? So he had so much access, and he worked for PayPal, so he was in the PayPal mafia, right? So Reed Hoffman and all these guys introduced him to roll off both. Of, so it's just like there's there's a lot of weird things. You can't just look at the end result, the outcome, and say. Because there's a lot of things that go into it. So there's a lot of luck and timing and relationships and there's all kinds of things and you can't replicate those things. It's not like, well, next time I'll just do that. <laughs> not quite. Right. It doesn't really work that way. Um, but it's really interesting. So um, I, I got a few other things in here. So just question for you. Like, did you ever find any commonalities with these wealthy individuals in terms of like early life trauma maybe that drip, drove them for like the, the, the billionaires I'm talking about, the most successful ones? Um, because I think we kind of know the paths of the virtuosos as, as Tom Corley would say, right? Um, that's just a predictable path. That's a path like my cousin's an orthopedic surgeon, right? We grew up in the same town had very the same socioeconomic conditions. We had very similar uh, family life and very similar public schooling and everything. Um, but he took school really seriously. My aunt pushed that really hard on him. He went to William and Mary, then he went to UMDNJ, and it was a real long, hard path to becoming an orthopedic surgeon. It's not an easy path. It takes 10 plus years to actually start making any money, right? Uh, but now he's been a surgeon for a while and he's doing well and he'll continue to do well for the rest of his life. You know, and he'll be very wealthy when he when he's much older. Um, so do you see any commonalities towards these? If he's like any of the orthopedic surgeons I know, he's got a lot stronger hands than, than you and I do. Because every time <laughs> I shake the hand of an orthopedic surgeon, I'm like, holy cow. We better hope so. Guy, you know, <laughs> right, right to that. You know, the commonalities as to what makes somebody, you know, successful, this is sort of my first book, Clutch, talked about people yeah. who are great under pressure. And the ones who are great under pressure can, you know, they have a tremendous amount of focus, they have a, a tremendous amount of discipline to follow that path, they adapt when something goes wrong, they remain, you know, present, and, you know, ultimately, for a lot of entrepreneurs, there, there's always this battle between fear and the fear and desire, the desire to be wildly successful, but the fear, like, as you said, you know, with these, these, these dreamers, um, that it can all go wrong. And if it all goes wrong, how do I recreate it? But th that's the path to wealth. When you talk about stuff that comes out of the childhood, that's more how we think about the money that we've acquired. And there are a lot more, you know, links. There. That's actually some research, you know, kind of actual mm -hmm. real academic research that I did with, you know, Brad Klontz, and he talks a lot about um, these different, and, and it's almost something that financial advisors should start thinking about, these the, the different sort of, you know, mindsets that, mm -hmm. that people have. And so if, you know, your net worth is your self-worth, you know, you, you're never really going to be fulfilled. And But that mm -hmm. person could have, you know, $100,000 in the bank, or that person could have $100 million in, in the bank. It's still going to be that same thing that drives it. You have some people who have a real sort of scarcity mindset and and those are the problematic ones who have saved you know whatever say they've saved two million dollars but they only have expenses of twenty thousand dollars a year or they spent two hundred million dollars and they only have expenses of two hundred thousand dollars a year they're almost you know they don't give themselves uh the the freedom to spend and enjoy it and those mm -hmm. are the people who you know particularly brad Klons, i mean he's done a lot more of this th than i have i he and i just partnered on a couple things it really goes deep deep back to you know, how people thought about money as a child. So, so the easy example for people to grasp is uh, you have a house, um, uh, mom and dad, uh, two kids, hard times, you're about to lose the house. You can't make the mortgage payment. Now, that's the fact. Uh, now, the three different scenarios that play out will shape how those kids think about money. The first is the family loses the house. The house is gone. The second is grandma and grandpa come in and they save the house for the family. And the third is, you know, mom and dad found a way to save that house mm -hmm. themselves. So the same basic fact, you're about to lose the house, but those three different things that happen to the house are going to shape those kids more than the basic fact that they almost lost the house. And that's something that you have to bear in mind. You know, think back. We can all be introspective and think back and see if we have those moments and our own childhood and chances are going to shape how we think about money. It's funny you say this because I say this on my, my show a bunch. Um, in 1990, we had a recession and I was a kid. I was in middle school at the time. And uh, and we, my dad was out of work. He was a carpenter. He was out of work for like a year. And I think that had a profound impact on the way I thought about money and it, it created some fear and anxiety at an early age. And I just never wanted to have that for my future family and my kids and myself actually. Um, so I was really focused on that as I got older. It's, it's like, it, was, it wasn't like I was thinking about this my whole life, right? But I remember that event and I, that, that year and I remember sure. it when I got a little bit older, like after college and, 
and I was really stressed coming out of college. Like, what the hell am I going to do in my life? I'm sure most people are. Um, and then I just became an entrepreneur in tech, and and, and just kind of kept fighting and fighting and fighting on it. And to your point about the you know three you know you're going to lose a house kind of thing, it was like I was never going to let myself fail. I just and I failed many 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 times. But in my mind, it was just like I was just figuring out what not to do. <laughs> right? So that's right. for me. Um, so early life trauma is kind of one thing. Um, uh, another thing I talk about with the people who come to my show that are high achievers is like fatherhood. Um, and that leads into your business too, which we'll get into. Um, did you find any commonalities with them related to their father or the relationship with their fathers? Is, is there anything there? I mean, I don't know about that. I don't know if I ever went, you know, that deep. What always impressed me though, were the people who, um, like thought deeply about parenting as it related to their wealth and there's this guy that i talked to once who he realized that you know every three years you get a new range rover full-size range rover you know hundred twenty thousand dollar car and his what his daughter just got used to having that range rover come in every three years and he thought well this is kind of messed up uh because that was his that was his treat he didn't he he didn't come from a lot he he'd sort of built it up and he just liked the new car and so that's when he took her aside and used that as a way to communicate the value of money and to the very, you know, the simplest form to tell her that to buy that $120,000, you know, Range Rover in their tax bracket, he was earning somewhere between, you know, 220 and 240, you know, to get that, you know, after tax, you know, Range Rover. Then he would talk to her about, you know, how much does it cost to insure this Range Rover? How much does it cost for gas? You can only put premium gas in a Range Rover. You can't put the crappy gas in a Range Rover. And he used that as a starting point to have a, and the funny thing was i talked to him i don't know 15 years ago i started talking to him but probably four or five years ago his daughter was doing something um in new york and reached out to me to talk to me not knowing i had you know heard this story that her father had told me and she was awesome like she was just a, a young 20 something woman uh super motivated to, to do she was working in the art world and like totally focused not resting on, you know, her parents' wealth and going forward. And I attribute, you know, some portion of that to, you know, a, a, a parent who said, we've got to break it down and explain, you know, where this money comes from. Now, the opposite side of that, the parents who are the worst at this um, mm -hmm. are the parents who pretend they can hide their wealth. They pretend that they can just not say anything. And I'm like, come on, people. There, there's this thing called Zillow. You go on Zillow <laughs> and it tells you how much your house is worth. Right. I mean, there's, if you type in, you know, Mercedes SL convertible, it tells you how much the car costs. And if you're super successful, you know, as you said, you know, they may get your net worth wrong. So but at some point, somebody's going to type in dad or mom's name and it's going to pop up. And, and this is so. But people still think they can. It's this thing called this. the Internet. Like, <laughs> yeah. This thing called the Internet. And, and you go on this thing called the Google and the, you go on the Google and the Google finds all kinds Do of your stuff. Googles. But. <laughs> In the mind, they think like, well, if I don't say anything, well, it's like, would you not talk yeah. to your kids about sex? If you did not talk to your kids about sex, you would be a horrible human being. Do you not talk to your kids about, you know, wearing their seatbelts in the car? If, for the love of God, your little kids, do you not talk to your little kids about brushing your teeth? I mean, come on. Yeah. Like, you have to, of course. you know, it's not appropriate to tell a 10-year-old that, you know, mom makes hundred thousand dollars a year a million dollars a year or ten million dollars a year that that, that ten-year-old isn't going to get it but it's really important to talk to that ten-year-old about choices because yeah. you know this you got four kids kids are you know wired to compare themselves to others and so they're going to walk into somebody's house and the first thing they're going to think is is that person's house bigger than my house or smaller than my house and if you just play that conversation off and try to ignore it try to like have them watch a show you've lost an amazing opportunity to talk to them about the choices people make uh, yep. with money in their lives. And that's what the, the other guy's book is about, which is it's about habits, right? Like he's saying it's your daily habits, the choices, and it is. I think wealth has a lot, there's a little bit of luck involved, a little bit of luck. I wouldn't attribute it largely. My book is totally better. I don't, I don't know this guy. I don't know this guy. My book is better. Stop promoting this other guy's book. My book is better. The company dad's is better. This is America. We already went through this. We're above average here. Mine is better. But the point that I'm making is that it's about your habits, right? And I think most people, uh, th they chalk it up when they haven't made the right choices in life and they'll say, well, that guy just got lucky, whoever those wealthy people are. And they don't realize that on a daily basis, compounded, you are making bad choices 
consistently, right? Let's make it make let's say making a hundred thousand dollars a year. You shouldn't be driving an eighty thousand dollar car, right? You should be saving, um, you know, and and but they're not, right? Or you should be putting into your retirement, your four hundred one k, or whatever it is, and and they're not. And those those have profound impacts in two or three decades. It's it takes a long time. This is, I mean, this is chapter five of the Thin Green Line. I talk about it in the book there, but it's also, you know, it, to use a highfalutin scientific term, it's it's the locus of control. And understanding the locus of control is key. And what does that mean? It's the people who are most successful believe that they are able to control their destiny and drive forward. If something goes wrong, they assess and say, huh, what did I do wrong? Could I have done something better? They don't say, well, you know, there was a recession in in 2008 and nine. And if it wasn't for that, I would have made it. Because guess what? A lot of people came out of 2009 a hell of a lot wealthier than they were going in. And a locus of control that is sort of outer directed and not inner directed is the locus of control that says things are happening to me. I don't have control over this. Yeah. This is, you know, uh, well, it's a fault of so-and-so or, or had so-and-so ever done this earlier on, it, it would have been different. Or so-and-so's dad uh, had this job. So of course he's successful. Why could I be successful? Mm-hmm. There is across the board, no successful person. And I don't define this by wealth. You could be the, the greatest a uh, high school English teacher in New Jersey, that person, you know, that man or woman has focused on becoming the greatest high school English teacher in New Jersey and takes, you know, his or her job super seriously and knows all the books to recommend, knows how to connect with those kids. That's the locus of control. They're not saying, oh, my principal was kind of crappy or the school board, you know, gave me some shit or I had a kid who fell asleep in class. No, they're going at that person and that classroom and that job to try to be the best they can. I agree with that 100%. Um, so today, there's almost 10% of Americans are millionaires. I saw a study, it was like almost 9% actually. So I'm saying closer to 10, but I think it was like 8.8%. This is last year. Um, that's crazy. A million dollars ain't what it used to be. <laughs> um, so tell me what the <laughs> difference between wealthy and rich is, and do you consider having a million dollar net worth rich anymore? Possibly is the answer to the last part, but the difference between being wealthy and rich is if you're wealthy, you have control over your choices. You can make the choices you want in life, whether you're a school teacher or a billionaire. If you're rich, you life is going to control you at some point. If if you, you don't make a lot of money, well, there's not not much you can do. You just have to work harder. That's yeah. just life's unfair. But you could be, you know, super successful hedge fund guy, uh, and people think you're worth, you know, eight hundred million dollars, but you're worth eight million dollars. But you have, you know three homes, four cars, a boat, you know, you fly private. Uh, That's somebody who's got a a rich mindset, not uh, a wealthy mindset. You know, on your question of a million dollars, you know, I remember I gave this talk once for the second book um, in in Chile. Like, this is like my Ron Burgundy moment. Uh, The book didn't do so great in the U.S., but in Chile, I was kind of a big deal. (laughs) Um, And so, but I went through the audience and I'd always ask these questions. I would say, you know, will anybody raise their hand and tell me, have you ever argued with your wife? all the hands go up. You know, have you ever, you know, told your friends about problems you've had with your kids? Hands go up. Uh, Anybody here ever have a health scare? Hands go up. Anybody here ever have cancer? You know, are you okay? Hands go up. So this is great. Uh, I said, you know, last question. Would somebody, uh, just could you just all tell me how much money do you have in the bank? No (laughs) hands go up. Ever. And so then I'll unpack it. I'll unpack it and I'll say, well, guess what? You, you told me about your spouse and the marital problems you may or may not have. You told me about your child, you know, or your children, the most important things for most people's lives. You've told me about that you've had health issues. You've told me about cancer. You've told me about something that's been inside your body, you know, killing cells. But you won't tell me about money. And that's what you don't understand. Because if you told me you had a million dollars, if you told me you had $10 million, I, I don't have any concept of that. If you have worked and earned Thirty or forty thousand dollars your entire life, and you have a million dollars. That's amazing. If you started off life inheriting twenty million dollars, and you're down to a million dollars, what have you done? You know, and so that's where it all is relative. At one point, probably fifteen years ago, um, Ted Turner, you know, made a fortune in CNN. He announced, you know, I love Ted. I met Ted a couple times. You know, the mouth of the south. He came out and had. I don't know if he had a press conference or if he just answered questions. He said, "You know what?" I'm down to my last billion dollars. <laughs> and he said it seriously. He's like, seriously, at one point he had seven billion or six billion, whatever the hell he had. How did that even happen, by the way? Billion. Yeah, it's crazy. It doesn't matter. But it's like, and he had, he had made a huge pledge to the United Nations. It was a gigantic pledge to the United Nations, and he was trying to fulfill it, but he was worried 
because he was down to his last billion dollars. <laughs> and now I think he got all the buffalo and the bison now. And so I think I think it's probably on its way back up. But I mean, that is crazy. But to him, in his mindset, at one point he had whatever he had, six or seven billion dollars. Imagine if Elon Musk today came out and said he has eight hundred million dollars left. You can't even imagine falling that far from whatever he has now, 170, you know, billion dollars. But that's why that number, that million dollars in that example is, is just, it's all relative. It all depends where you were and how you got there. Tell me the number one thing you saw as a difference between the wealthy and the not wealthy. That was back to that question before. The locus, it's the locus of control. The locus of control is 100%. It's, mindset. it's all mindset. It, yeah, but it's like, you know, I always think of like my aunt who you know referenced before who was a special ed teacher in high school and she did everything she was supposed to do. She, you know, uh, worked the number of years she was supposed to, to get her pension. She put extra money into her 403B. She got a good financial advisor. Unfortunately, my uncle died young, but he had insurance because that's what you're supposed to do. You buy term life insurance because random shit happens sometimes. And she now can do everything she wants to do. Now, is she getting on a private jet and going over to Davos? <laughs> She's not doing that. But is she, you know, taking a vacation with some of her girlfriends? She is. Is she going to see my cousins and seeing her grandkids? She is. You know, is she volunteering? She is. So she's able to do everything she wanted to, but she had that that discipline early on to save the way she was supposed to save. So she can now enjoy, you know, enjoy her retirement. So you've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people that are wealthy, billionaires included. Um, is there a secret society? Is there a club? Is there the skull and bones or Masons, Masonic Temple? Like a lot of people think this stuff. Like, is this a thing? I mean, they do exist, but like, is this a path to? Tell me about that. Has anybody ever talked to you about this when you've interviewed these people? Like a like a handshake or something like that? Was it all, like all fist bumpers or something like that? <laughs> well, is there an inside club for the wealthiest of the wealthy? Have they? Has this has this come up ever in a conversation when you've done interviews? I mean, is there an inside club? Well, guess what? You know, if you have a private jet, you're flying places where. <laughs> you know, private jet people go. So, you know, is that, is that inside club? It's called Nantucket. It's called Nantucket <laughs> in, in August. That's where that secret society is. Well, Davos, you mentioned, right? That's, that's kind of an inside club, right? That's an inside club. It's you gotta be invited to go there. <laughs> go play Pebble beach and look at the, the people whose homes, you know, line the, the, the greatest public course in, in, in the world. But you don't, you don't get there until you've actually gotten there. That's the kind of the, that's the thing, right? You're not invited until you've made it right. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, look, I'm a huge golfer. And so, you know, you're not getting into uh, Augusta National by, you know, calling up the chairman and saying, you know, I, I, you know I, I've been watching the Masters on TV for a long time. It's, this is great. And, you know, I just sold my company for a billion four. And frankly, you could be very wealthy and not get in there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and so the club is more like, it's clubs are clubs. Like you want to, you want to associate with, you know, people you like. And, you know, billionaires are, you know, have all made their wealth in a completely different way. And so yeah, the yeah. inheritor billionaire who inherited a bunch of money and then bought some real estate is a heck of a lot different than the billionaire who, you know, ran through all the money he made in his first company. And then, you know, right before he was about to run out of cash, the, the idea took and it, and it lifted off. Th those two people are not going to you know, they're not going to be sharing a, a Gulf Stream on the way back from Nantucket. So there's a difference between types of billionaires. You've, you've, you've mentioned you've interviewed, uh, I think in your article I've read, the, you, you, I actually met him once actually at a baseball game, Michael Bloomberg, um, took a picture with him, it was pretty cool. But there's a difference between tech billionaires, I, I think, from billionaires I've met, and the Wall Street type or the old school billionaires. Did you see a difference between the types of billionaires that there are today, like the new money versus the old money, so to speak? Even sure. though even though the finance millionaires can be new money, but they sort of act like old money, I think. Well, you know, Mike Bloomberg is a sort of super unique case in that when he was fired from Solomon in the 80s, he was given whatever it was, 10 or $20 million. 10 or $20 million in the 1980s. He didn't have to do anything, you know, ever again. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then, and he did. And then he did something and it was really technocratic. Like what, you know, labor intensive, those terminals are what make all the money. It's not the news, it's nothing like that. And that was capital intensive. And he just was, you know, he was a good leader. He was a good organizer. You know, I, I worked for Bloomberg briefly. You know, I interviewed a couple of times. Um, and he's super down to earth, you know, yeah, like. Nice guy. If you ran into him at one of his golf clubs, uh, you know, he, he'd chat with you. You know, if you want to, if he had an opening, you'd, you'd join his foursome. That's, I, like I said, I was, I was, I brought my, I brought my grandfather to a baseball game in the Legends section of the Yankees Stadium. And he was sitting with, he was three, three, well, three rows back. He was in the front row. And he was with, um, 
what was the guy? Uh, Henry Kissinger. He was with Henry Kissinger. And uh, we got to hang out and talk and took photos and stuff. And my grandfather's birthday, his 85th birthday. And and the funny thing is that when I tapped him on the shoulder, the security people jumped up. <laughs> They're like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> I didn't even know they were there. They had these things in their ears. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. And then he turned around. He goes, it's okay. You want a photo? And I was like, no offense, uh, Michael. I was like, uh, but my grandfather wanted to say hi to Henry. And he goes, oh, Henry turns around. He goes, look at that. I'm the celebrity now. It was really funny. <laughs> but, the, but the real down to earth, he was a down to earth guy. And so was Henry. They were really nice people, you know? Um, they could have said, get the hell out of here, kid. <laughs> I guess, obviously, billionaires who are crabby and irascible and don't want to talk to you, they obviously exist, but they wouldn't have talked to me in the first place. So, so I, I, you know, the people who are going to opt in to talk Excuse. to me are going to, yeah, I mean, I remember talking once, he, he's passed away now, but John Huntsman Sr., um, he created, you know, Huntsman, this chemical company, uh, the, the clamshell package for the uh, Big Mac, uh, packing oh, okay, yeah. Uh, every yogurt container you've ever had uh, in your house, um, uh, the skein for the, the Lamborghini. Um, and he was wildly successful. He was wildly philanthropic. He spent a lot of money uh, donating to cancer research. He just you know, let it go. And I couldn't get off the phone with him because he just was an interesting guy. He just wanted to talk. He was as, as interested in me and my family as I was in hearing his story. And he had you know, eight kids and his one of his sons was the governor of Utah. Um, fascinating guy. Um, but again, he wanted to you know, share his story and, and tell about you know, what he was trying to do to to advance you know, cancer research. So he was up to talking to me. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, there are plenty of guys like that who surely would, you know, never have. Picked what about the up. tech guys? Did you, did you talk to the I know you're in Connecticut and the East Coast. Did you did you talk to a lot of the billionaire tech fo folks out in you know, the Silicon Valley at all for your interviews? Have you done them? Not a, not a lot. Not a lot of the, if I think about it, not a lot. Of, I mean, the recent ones. I mean, I talked to Pierre Omidyar, um, yep, who eBay. you know, made his money with eBay. And he was fascinating. But I talked to him after he'd, he'd moved on. And he was And he's out in guy. Hawaii, said, away from the tech scene these days, right? Yeah. <clears throat> he's away from the, well, yeah, but you know, there's a lot of the, that's where all the tech guys go for their, their warm weather place. I mean, this yeah. Brad Klontz was based in Hawaii for a long time because it was a great place to sort of be a financial therapist. You know, there are lots yeah. of, you know, lots of wealthy people there. But Omid Yar, when I talked to him, he had already moved on and he was investing in news organizations, different sure. things. But he was humble. He said, look, you know, I worked really hard for three years, I didn't have a vacation for three years but when i talked to him he's probably worth eight billion i don't know what he's worth now probably 20 billion you know he, he had this sense of perspective about it so therefore you know he was trying to you know use that wealth to do something else to do something interesting and help people and we you touched on it earlier we talked about um talking to your kids and communicating wealth to your kids um my wife and i similar thing like kids came to our house but when my kids were growing my oldest is 10 right so when they were kind of growing up it was never a thought of what we have what we didn't have it there was nothing to compare it to then it started meeting kids in the neighborhood i'll never forget one time this kid comes over he's like whoa you guys have a mansion my my daughter's like what's a mansion dad i was like oh my god we have to have this conversation now about like yeah. what we have and so it's it's an awkward thing but at a certain age i think it was like seven i think that she started to ask us about things comparatively to our friends, um, you know, and her, 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 the parents of her friends and stuff like that. Um, but it's a, it's a very touchy subject. So they must have talked to you about that as well as passing the wealth down. I have a lot of friends that are wealthy that are like, I'm not giving my kids anything or just enough. Like what kind of conversations have you had with those, with the folks about that, with the passing of the wealth to their kids? Well, yeah, the first part that I'll answer is, is that the, the touchy subject because of the you know, age range among kids uh, and then you know, people who have sort of second families. I mean, if you mm -hmm. had, you know, just for argument's sake, uh, kids who range from like 20 to eight or something like that, a 12 year gap, um, that oldest kid um, is gonna have experienced a very different mm -hmm. childhood than that youngest kid. And there's no way you can really equalize yep. for it because if you're building your business, building your wealth, you know, that 20 year old has just a different perspective. So it's just something that parents have to be aware of because yeah. if you're not open and honest about it, it's just going to build resentment and it's not, and the resentment probably won't be toward you. The resentment will be toward the siblings. You know, you had it easier than me, you know, <laughs> by the time you came along, you know, mom and dad were flying private or, or, you know, dad gave up telling you the story about how much a Range Rover costs. He got tired of telling that story again and again. <laughs> so you just got the Range Rover, you, you know. Exactly. Uh, I mean, that's how, people don't have perspective. They're like, you know, my first car was a Volvo. Yours is a Range Rover. Like, a Volvo's a nice car. I mean, th that's how parents have to be, you know, proactive and, and, and kind of get engaged. You know, talking to kids about, you know, money, they all, people, people who worry about it, 
um, are fine. It's the people who don't worry about it because they think the wrong things. They, they come back to the people who don't want to have the, the conversation. The belief is if I give my kids X amount of dollars, if I tell my kids I'm worth you know, X millions or billions of dollars, that's going to rob them of motivation. Motivation and wealth are two very separate things. But if you, yeah, if, if you don't understand that, you're going to conflate the two and that causes problems. You know, you want to have your kids, you know, motivated. You want, but that comes from little things of, uh, you know what? You brought your math homework down home. Uh, I can obviously do fifth grade math with you, but I'm not going to do fifth grade math with you. I'll answer the questions and walk you through it, but I could obviously get the right answers to fifth grade math. You got to do your best. And if you get the wrong answers, that's great. That's fine. It's homework. You now have to go in and talk to your teacher and figure out why you don't understand fifth grade math. But that's really, you know, this kind of the boots on the ground. Values. You've got it. Yeah, it's, it's values and communicating to that. And it's also being really honest and, you know, transparent. Like, what are mom and dad doing? You, you, you know, this, you got four kids. You could tell your kids until you're blue in the face. You got to do the following things. But if you don't do them yourself, your kids aren't going to listen to you. You know, like if I don't, you know, like we're fortunate, we, we've got some, some people helping us out, but like I do the dishes, like I, on the weekends, they see me do the dishes. If I'm telling them, take the dishes from the table and put them in the sink, I'm there doing it as well. Because if I tell them, take the dishes and put it today, I, I got a tween. The tween lets you get away with nothing. He's like, well, why aren't you doing it? I was like, well. That's what my 10 year old says to like, me. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's not fair. And I'm like, life's not fair, kiddo. <laughs> like, life's not fair. Like, why are you doing it? Like, uh, but it's, it's that type of, you know, instilling those values early on and also explaining to them that, look, the world's most successful teacher is not going to make as much money as the world's worst prop trader. It's just the way the world works. So some people are going to earn more money based on how they've you know, selected their career. But what you really want to do is have achievement. You want to be the world's best teacher. You want to be the world's best yes. prop trader. You want to be the world's best, you know, orthopedic mm-hmm. surgeon. It's that that growth mindset of the constant improvement and yep. you know you could be the world's best you know teacher and awesome you could hopefully you meet somebody nice hopefully you have some kids you know if that's what you want to do and, and you live in a really nice 2000 square foot house and you do the things that you can do and those are going to be your friend and you got a good life you could be the yep. world's best prop trader and obviously live in a, in a bigger house but you still have to you know have everything be commensurate with with what you do and it's more important to strive that, that sort of inner growth and strive to be the best at whatever you're doing and try to instill that in your kids. I, I agree 100%. It's values, right? It's teaching your kids values. Uh, I have a friend um, that sold this company for a lot of money and he's like, I don't know, I'm really conflicted if I want to give my kids that much. And I'm like, why? Like we came from nothing generationally, probably your family's never had anything. What's the old saying, uh, Paul? Is it short, 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 yeah. So it's like, don't, don't allow that to happen if you, if you can, but, but, put something in maybe a trust account or something that if they're like shitheads or something, they don't get anything. Right. But, um, but you know, but it's not just about the money. It's about constant improvement. It's striving. That's why I got my kids in sports. Right. So they're all playing sports. I was an athlete. My wife was an all American athlete. She was much better than me in high school. Um, but (laughs) <laughs> like, like way infinitely better than I was. Um, but, but at the end of the day, it's like, we're just teaching them, um, to, to, to try to focus on what you can control and try to get better every day. Like that's what we focus on with them, right? And uh, we'll see where it ends up. I don't care if they become wealthy on their own account. That doesn't matter. If they're happy with what they do, like you said, they can be the best teacher in the world. That's all that really matters. I don't really care as long as you're happy. So you gotta try to find that inner peace. And uh, But I wanna talk about the business now. So why don't you tell us about your business and how you came to this and why, you, just tell us, tell us about the company of dads. Awesome, yeah, so company of dads. And so I've been working on it for the past year. Uh, like many things, you know, COVID sort of changed my perspective, but for my entire time at the New York Times, everybody around my town knew me as, you know, Paul Sullivan, you know, Wealth Matters columnist at the New York Times. And, you know, I said it so much, it was like, oh my God, if I have to say that again. But, you know, look, it becomes part of your, you know, identity. But because I had such a rigid schedule at the Times, because I had a weekly deadline, because, you know, when I wrote books, I knew what the deadline was for the books. When somebody asked me to give a talk, nobody calls you up and says, hey, can you come to Vegas and give a talk to this organization uh, in two days? They say, hey, can you come to Vegas and give a talk to this organization in two months or in four months? And I could plan everything in my life. And my wife could not. My wife works in asset management in 2013, uh, shortly after our second daughter was born. She started her own business. She, you know, and and it's gone fantastically well. But even before that, 
I just, I like being a dad. I had an aptitude for it and I had a lot more control over my time. I own my time more than she owned her time. She was commuting in the city every day. Mm. I could go into the city uh, three times a day. My dad could come down and help out two or three times a day. So we're able to make it work. But that meant that I've got three daughters. You know, I was the one going to the pediatrician. I was the one going to, you know, ballet. I was the one as a ball guy doing a shitty job braiding hair, you know, to get them ready in the morning. But it was awesome. But there's no group. You know, there are a lot of men doing this, but there's not exactly a group form. And so it was during COVID when I was, you know, Paul Sullivan, New York Times, but I was also Paul Sullivan, like Zoom teacher. Like if you could see outside the door of my office, we have a little <laughs> room and I'd be out there. They'd be like, daddy, daddy, I can't get on to my math class. I'm like, I'm sorry, sir. Hold on one second. Paul Sullivan, New York Times, <laughs> need to pause. And I like scramble my ass out there and be like, okay, let me see how I fix this out, you know? Um, and I said, you know, be a little, you know, lonely. Like, you know, I'm a big golfer. I got my buddies on the golf course, but you're not playing golf that much during COVID because of course we're close. I wonder if there are other guys who feel like this. And, and I kept coming back to, you know, you're sitting in the 19th hole. You've you just had a great time with your buddies and all your friends who are more traditional dads, more go-to-work dads, you know, they're looking at their email and they got this going on, that going on. Maybe they're, you know, some for work. And I look at my email and I, I, I turn up and I say, Jesus Christ, do you have any idea how hard it is to get a four-year-old into a ballet class in this town? <laughs> and they look at me like, are you drunk already? Like, what have you done to celebrate? <laughs> Like, how is this up? But like, that was the sort of, you know, idea. And so as I started thinking it through, I said, who can I test this out with? And the group I knew would have an answer for me would be senior female executives, women who were the absolute top of their game. Because I figured one of three things was, was going on. They either were very, super wealthy and very successful, and they could choose to hire multiple nannies and housekeepers and manage the kids that way. Yeah. Or two, they their parents had them young, so their 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 mom or dad, their grandparents weren't all that old, right. so they could come, little help, and live in, take care of the kids, the sort of Obama model when they were president. Like you know, her mom came lived there, or they had a husband who had a job that was in some way uh, more flexible uh, or more rigid or less you know time consuming, and that was the model of the lead dads. And one of the women I went out to to talk to said, "Yeah, my husband's a lead dad. You got this right." But your idea to turn this into a book is a horrible idea. And I said, okay, why? Because people don't read anymore. Like your days of, of sitting there writing, you know, your 250-page book. And, you know, you know that Borders doesn't exist anymore. It's like, oh, I've heard that. I've heard they that. Re they read the title and the subtitle. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's like, oh, yeah. You know, oh, he, he autographed it for me. I'll put it on my shelf. Um, and he's, what this is is a media company. This isn't a book. And when I had that conversation with her, it clicked because what am I trying to do? I'm trying to create a community for a growing group of men who feel uh, completely isolated, who are you, you, the loneliest guy on a playground is, is the lead dad surrounded by stay at home moms because nobody's coming up to him and like, Hey buddy, you want to come out to lunch with us? You want, let's go get, we're going to get, Hey, you're going to get lunch. You want to come, we'll get some sandwiches or like, it, it just doesn't happen. And so I was super fortunate with the times when I said to him, I said, look, you know, I, it's been great. I'm, I'm going to wind this down. Uh, and they said, really? I said, yeah. Are you sure? I said, yeah. And I said, oh, and I'm, no, I'm not going to the Wall Street Journal. Like, I'm not, I'm not going, I'm doing <laughs> something else. And like, huh. And so they, it was great honor. They gave me this piece called uh, The Times Insider. It runs on the second page of the front section. And it was, you know, kind of a recap. And I thought it'd just be like, you know, looking back, like this is great, kind of a greatest hit. And they said, no, 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 we don't want that. You can do a little bit of that in the beginning. People kind of interested in how, how columnists work. But what we really want you to do is talk about um, what you're going to do next. And and th think about it, Jay. Think about every any company you've ever left. Have they said on your way out the door, oh, hey, you know what? I know you're leaving. We're a little pissed that you're leaving. Could you just send emails around to all your clients and all your contacts? <laughs> Tell them where you're going next and send them send them your email so they can get in touch with you. Like, this doesn't happen. Yeah, it's pretty cool that they did that. That speaks volumes to you, though. That's what that is. That's 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 really about you and what they respected you as a person. That's the only reason why they did that. I guess. I guess they liked me. Who knew? They I, did. You know, I, I, they, I, that had to be right. You know, my motto has always been: you know, don't ask a question if you don't want to hear the answer. So, God forbid, <laughs> I'm never going to ask him. Like, do you like me? It's um, implied. <laughs> The last bit of that column sort of you know sets up tells this joke yep. about me interviewing this high-ranking you know. A former White House cabinet uh, official, and I have to hang up on her. I have to hang up yes. on her because the pediatrician is calling. 
and I have to do it in a way that is believable. And so it's like, that's a wonderful point you made. And I was just wondering, you know, mid sentence, take the call. And I'd never forgotten that. And I said, this is what I want to do. I want to create a community where this doesn't have to be a secret anymore. I mean, right. come on, we're not like kicking, kicking puppies. This is not a secret society of kicking puppies. This is not what we're doing. These are men who are lead dads, um, who want to, you know, Should be celebrated. find it fulfilling. Yeah. Yeah, who find it fulfilling. They're helping their spouse fulfill their potential, but they want other guys. We're, we're guys. Like, we want to have somebody to have a beer with. We want to have somebody to to argue about sports with. We want to go on a fill-in-the-blank, you know, golf trip, ski trip, whatever. We want to get together with other guys. Just as, you know, if you get together a whole bunch of founders in the tech industry, you guys all have a common language. We dads all have a common language. Well, Fortunately, uh, fortunately, you know, knock on wood, you know, I, I was right. And, and the response was overwhelming from lead dads, uh, senior female executives who have a lead dad, uh, senior female executives who husbands don't do shit. And they said, can you, uh, start a lead dad boot camp? Cause this isn't really get working. Get this guy in. <laughs> <laughs> like, get this guy, teach him, just get him from 5% to 25%. It'll make everything better. And then, and then, and then companies, corporate America reached out because this is a perfect thing to come in and, and, and talk to the employees. About. And so I'm off to the races. You know? and so it's a media company. So you're going to create a lot of content, I'm guessing, right? And then share the content and then uh, monetize the content in some way. Subscription plan too? Is there a subscription to this? Uh... The, the, the model is, you know, content, community, commerce. And so you think of Disney, Disney's model is content to commerce. I'm putting the the community uh, component in there, and I want everything to drive to community. So when it launches in in you know or in twenty twenty two, what's the goal? The goal is initially is pure growth. Drive as many people, make people aware of it, get people there. You know, show them that there's content that they can identify with. Shot a whole bunch of funny videos, but there's also a lot of serious stuff in there, like tips, and get that. You know, we're using Discord in the beginning. Get that that community site up and running, and then it's you know obviously the, the commerce component in the beginning is, you know, this guys go someplace, we always buy something, we buy a hat, you know, we, we, we buy a shirt with a logo on it, but it's really more than that. There's an educational component. There's an events component. There's getting people together because obviously it has to exist in the internet and you know, online at first, but I want it to be a real community where, you know, it, it hits people at all different socioeconomic levels. If, if, if you can't get out and meet in person, Fine. You're going to be on the on the you know on the community site. You're going to get a lot out of that. If you can meet geographically, awesome. We're all going to get together as lead dads. We're planning an event for the spring in Connecticut. That's going to be great. And then if you have a, a little more resources or you want to save up, you want to go on like a lead dad ski trip. We're going to have that for you. And you know, there's a sponsorship model to that. People are going to pay to do it. The sponsorship model for you know brands that want to be you know identified with the company of dads. It's interesting. I mean, I, I have from the tech space, so I know a lot of guys that sold their companies and they kind of just hang at the house with the wife and neither of them are working for the most part for my friends that are like this. So they're, they're, I wouldn't say they're lead dads they are kind of like co-workers as parenting equal in some way, I guess. I don't know. They, they kind of like divide and conquer, but um, but they're there all the time. Right. And like that is very, very unusual in America on average to have both your parents home all the time. I'm one of those dads. Um, I have a lot of my friends, like I, like I said, like that. But um, I, I know very few that are actually, like you've said, that are the lead dad. Um, but it's happening more and more often. So I'm sure it's going to be, it's really going to be an interesting business to see how this develops. What's your market size, by the way? Just curious, how, how many of the lead dads, have you done some research on this? Like, what, what, what's the size of that market? Oh, it's, it's the census data and coming out of COVID, it's in the tens of millions. Uh, but it's also wow. got this sort of, you know, international, but I had this guy reach out to me from Canada who, whose lifelong dream was to be a pilot. And he was a pilot in the Royal Canadian Air Force. And then, you know, after a while, you probably get tired of being, you know, shot at or, you know, shooting at things. And so he went to work for Air Canada, flying a plane. That was pretty awesome. But then they had a child and his wife is an oncologist. Like literally his wife is trying to save people from cancer and they had to make a choice and so he took this job working for the canadian equivalent of the faa and he likes it he likes what he's doing still in aviation misses flying a bit um but loves being the lead dad loves you know being there with his kids and and you know his wife is doing great work but his buddies don't get it his buddies who are still pilots are like are you out of your mind like we're pilots man like you know come on, <laughs> top gun like, like this is, but it but i've also had guys reach out to me a guy i know really well in my town who wanted to talk to me and he says, can we talk about this, you know, off the record? I was like, well, I'm not at the times anymore. What are you talking about? I, was like, I just don't want anyone to know 
that I'm the lead dad, but he was super serious. And here's a guy who works <laughs> in real estate, very successful, but his wife is more, you know, I don't know if it, what, that's what, his wife makes more money and has a job that's, you know, more constrained working in the city as an nurse. But here's this guy who wants to be part of this group, who wants to have a place to talk, but it's almost like, uh, like back to the secret society. Like he's, he's afraid that it, our, our mutual friends will find out about it. And that's what I want to end. I want to, there are more lead dads out there than we know, but they're hiding and there's no reason that they need to be hiding. My neighbor across the street, um, his wife went to law school. She became a lawyer. His father lives right next door to me. So the kid lives across the street, but they went to Pepperdine University, came back, she went to NYU, and then she's now a partner at his father's firm and she'll take over the firm when he retires. And he does real estate on the side, but he's really a lead dad. Like he's always yeah. at the soccer and at the baseball and and he's taking the kids everywhere, bringing them, dropping them off at school, picking them up. Like he is basically like all the other moms. He's always like talking to the moms and stuff like that. And I think it's the coolest thing in the world. I mean, like he's gonna have those memories for the rest of his life. His kids are gonna have those memories for the rest of his life. I'm sure Karen, his wife, is like, I wish I could do that. You know, I'm sure she does, but that's just the path that they have, and that's just the way life developed. And they're both totally comfortable with it. And and just so you know, he's yeah. not ashamed of it. He's totally comfortable in his own skin. He doesn't give a crap what anybody thinks about it. You know, he, he and so. But I, I can't wait to show him the site because maybe he'll be interested in it to see other dads that are local around here that doesn't even know they're like lead dads. Maybe so it'll be interesting to see how it develops. Yeah, no, I'm excited. So thank you. Thank you for asking me about it. Absolutely. And um, when do you launch in? Like, when, when's your official launch going to be? Uh, well, it all depends how many of the, the eight people I have working for me uh, don't uh, succumb to COVID because it seems like <laughs> these breakthrough variants have not been great for my team. But the, the goal is, you know, by January 10th, the, the, the goal is by January 10th of 2022. Um, okay. Unless, you know, <laughs> we just lost a videographer the other day. So he's, everyone's fine, but... And I was looking at the social media. I noticed you haven't done any posts. You got all your, your accounts set up, right? I was looking at the website, checked out all the, like the Twitters and the Instagram. So I guess you're gonna like, those people are gonna work for you. They're gonna be pushing content out. It's gonna be like a content business to some extent, you said. So you're gonna be pumping that as well, right? It's gonna be like a fire hose. And, and again, you know, I, I'm always happy for, for people's advice, but this is, you know, you, you gotta get advice. And the social media, your social media manager said, look, we're just gonna yeah. come out all at once when we have something. Cause what are we driving people to? We can't drive people to something if it's not there. So we're getting yeah. it. The, the whole platform is going to launch in a pretty yeah, robust form yeah. and then we start pushing people to it because then they'll get something because then they'll come back you, know, you, you only get one shot to launch it like that that's right H have you heard of canva c-a-n-v-a.com canva.com mm -hmm. yeah that, I, I started using this recently for I, i've created something with my kids uh, not that i want to talk about this both here but we, we're doing some kind of instagram account it's like a joke thing whatever but and then we use canva i can't believe how robust that thing it's like using photoshop in a web browser it was like it's incredible so but if you already know what it is, so I guess, you know, that's yeah. cool. You'll be using that. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, really enjoyed uh, going through your career and, and, and the Wealth Matters column. That's really cool. Um, and I, I wish you the best of luck with the business you have. Thank, thank you for having me on. This was a blast. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Paul.